Guardsmen, as of today, we are starting to have introductory videos about the armies that can be found on the various fronts of our galaxy. Gradually, we will talk about each army. Perhaps this knowledge will give you a few extra minutes of life on the battlefield. And we'll start with the primitive savages, the Orcs. Orcs, or Greenskins as they are also known, are one of the most numerous Xenos known to the Empire. They were among the first alien adversaries that humanity encountered during the Great Dispersal of the Galaxy. Orcs are extremely strong and hardy creatures with not the most developed intelligence. However, they possess everything they need to fulfill their primary purpose, excellent fighting. According to the most popular theories, Orcs were created by the Ancients as a biological weapon against the Necrons advancing from all sides. So, it's no surprise that all Orcs want to do and can do is fight. If they didn't fight amongst themselves, but joined together to form one huge army, there's no doubt that no power in the galaxy would be able to resist their onslaught. The green skin of the Orcs is like a cancerous tumour on the body of the galaxy. For in the place of every destroyed empire we burn to the ground, a new one will arise, even larger and stronger. That is the nature of the Orcs. And that is why they are so difficult to destroy. They must be eradicated completely, or they will come back stronger again and again until there are too many of them. The Emperor of Mankind in conversation with Horus. Of particular interest is their biology. Orcs are the dominant species among the so-called Orcoids, too. This also includes the Gretchens, also known as Grots or Goblins. The Snotling is a smaller and less intelligent version of the Gretchens. Squigs are a special kind of animal and mushroom. Yes, the fact is that the Orcs' bodies are a unique combination of animal and fungus. The fungal component makes them extremely survivable and hardy, speeds up regeneration and increases resistance to pain. Orcs can survive even without arms and legs, withstand transplantation of the head or other important organs, and without anaesthetics and in unsanitary conditions. There are no female orcs. Reproduction occurs through spores, which orcs release throughout their lives. At death, even more spores are released from their bodies. From these spores, both normal fungi and the entire list of the orcoid family can grow. This type of reproduction is the reason why Orcs are widespread throughout the galaxy and makes it difficult to wage war against them. Even if an army of Orcs is destroyed, in a few decades new Orcs can grow on the place of their death and immediately rush to attack. Orcs are also known to grow throughout their lives. The more often they participate in battles, the more they grow. At the same time their skin becomes increasingly darker. Thus. By the size and colour of the skin, you can determine the status of an orc in his tribe. Speaking of orc social structure, all the information necessary for warfare is embedded in the orc genome, including an understanding of their social structure. The main contingent of orcs are boys or orc boys. They are the most common green-skinned orcs, with nothing remarkable about them. The strongest, largest and most cunning orcs become war bosses, the leaders who get the best food, weapons and resources, as well as the strongest subordinates. Bosses also have good intelligence and can develop tactics and strategies that can surprise even experienced Imperial commanders. A boss's word is law. However, his leadership can be challenged in a duel, which in most cases results in a massacre of overly bold or stupid orcs. The greatest bosses reach enormous proportions. During the War of the Beast, the Beast's most famous war boss was the size of a ten-story house and possessed exceptional intelligence. He almost became the end for the Empire of Mankind. But by the 41st millennium, such giants are no longer found. The boss is accompanied by the knobs, slightly smaller orcs, seasoned veterans of many battles who are highly regarded. Among regular fighters, they also lay claim to the best weapons and equipment after battles. Naturally, they are the elite infantry of the boss's army and make up his personal retinue. Although sometimes it happens that one of the knobs is the one who challenges his leader and takes his place. Before moving on to the next troop types, there's something else important to tell. One of the key features of orc culture is the psychic field that is generated by every green-skinned orc, especially when they come together. Orcs amplify this field 
and huge crowds of orcs generate colossal amounts of psychic energy. They call it Wah. The same word is also the main battle cry of the orcs. It is also what the war bosses call their huge armies and subsequent military campaigns. The orcs have their own deities, they are the twins Gork and Mork. Gork is strong but cunning and Mork is cunning but strong. According to belief, the gods of the orcs always accompany them in battle, and the psychic field is considered a manifestation of their power. This field influences the laws of the universe in some way. It manifests itself in the fact that if an orc believes in something strongly enough, it becomes reality. Thus, orcs have a tradition of attributing miraculous properties to different colours, and it is because of their confidence that most of their mechanisms work. Orcs believe that red speeds up cars, and vehicles painted red do indeed go faster than similar vehicles of other colours. The same applies to other colours. Blue brings luck, yellow means wealth or increased striking power, black means toughness and impenetrability, and purple means stealth. Orcs also love the colour green, considering it a symbol of their power. Orcs also like to decorate weapons, armour and equipment with black and white checkers, considering it a symbol of Gork and Mork. Separate segments of the Orc hierarchy are represented by the so-called Odd Boys. These include several different professions. Let's start, perhaps, with the Mech Boys. These are Orcs who happen to have information about Orc technology in their genes. They know how to assemble and repair weapons and mechanisms without any training. They just intuitively know how to do it. However, they may seek advice from more experienced mech boys to learn more complex technologies. Approaches can vary greatly from one mech boys to another. Often two inventions will be radically different but have roughly similar features and functionality. Mech boys are extremely important members of the orc community. Without them, orcs would be without small arms, transportation, cybernetic prosthetics and the like. They are the ones who give the orcs confidence in the functionality of their inventions, which has repeatedly perplexed the techno-priests of Mars. Captured examples of orc weapons are often primitively bonded pieces of metal that seemingly should not function as weapons. Yet against all odds in the hands of orcs, they work. As they gain experience, mech boys grow into big mechs. They also know how to build huge machines and are adept at teleportation and force field technology. They love to invent and experiment, including on their kin. Mech boys can turn an ordinary orc into a cyborg. Orc, stuffed with various prosthetics and is already more of a machine than the usual green-skinned. The cyborgs are created by the pain boys. Imagine the craziest scientist ever and multiply that by the fact that he's an orc. They have knowledge of orc medicine and can reattach a torn limb or heal a serious wound. But the real talent of the pain boys comes when they want to be creative. Replacing an orc's lungs with a tank of explosive gas, swap arms and legs, replacing the brain with a squig, all of these things can be expected when you lie down on his table and wake up from anesthesia. The pain boys like to surround themselves with an entourage of Gretchens, calling them Medgrots. The most famous of these is Grotznik, Boss Gajkul's personal medic. One day, Gajkul came running to Grotznik, trying to hold his brains falling out of a hole in his head. Grotznik put a new adamantium plate on him, and in less than a week, Gajkul became war boss. The orcs thought the miraculous plate was to blame and ran in droves to Grotznik, asking him to perform the same operation on them. What they didn't expect was that the cunning Doc was inserting bombs into their heads, which he activated both for protection and just for fun. The knobs realized that they couldn't attack Grotznik openly, so they decided to eliminate him by stealth. They lured him to a malfunctioning deaf dread machine, and suddenly it grabbed Doc and cut his head open with a circular saw. The Gretchens of Grotznik's entourage saw their dying master and decided to have some fun. They carried the Doc into his tent and spent the whole night saving his life. One Gretchen accidentally threw up in Doc's head, another had his favourite spider escape and take up residence in Grotznik's brain. Pain Boys died and was resurrected several times that night. By morning the operation was complete. Doc survived but had completely lost his mind. The first thing he did was start dancing and every move he made was accompanied by an explosion in the neighbouring tents. 
It was the knobs that took turns losing their heads. This was the beginning of Doc Sneak's even more gruesome experiments on his patients. He cut off several of his limbs, replacing them with body parts lying on the operating table, naturally without their consent. For such antics, someone would have probably killed him, if not for his vast combat experience and personal protection from Chief Gajkul. Next in the Orc hierarchy are the slavers. These are Orcs who have the patience to mess around with Gretchens and Snotlings. They train and coach them, often using mobs of these green dwarves in attacks. Slavers compete with each other in their training skills, trying to raise the most violent and bloodthirsty underlings. True, the natural cowardice of the Gretchens and Snotlings prevents this from happening. The racers have their own methods of persuasion, including whips and shock sticks. Sometimes they use hungry squig hounds who are happy to feast on green dwarves fleeing the battlefield. The sight of a Gretchen being eaten by a squig instantly boosts the morale of its brethren. Slavers are also the ones who breed the most deadly and large combat squigs. Particularly skillful and patient slavers are able to breed squiggoths, huge monsters, literally meat tanks on the backs of which they install combat platforms. The presence of such creatures on the battlefield is a terrifying sight. Last but not least are the Weird Boys. These are orcish psychers, whose uniqueness lies in the fact that they do not call upon powers, but upon the energy of wah. They absorb it and let it flow through them. While in the midst of a crowd, Weird Boys absorb psychic energy and expend it on various abilities, such as psychic vomiting or teleportation. Orcs shy away from Weird Boys and call them blast heads because if a weird boy is inexperienced or does not have time to use up all of his stored energy his head can explode from the exertion blowing up the surrounding orcs as well weird boys wear brightly colored clothing with bells and rattles warning orcs of approaching power and potential danger they also carry brass staffs that better help them control their energy weird boys don't like to use their powers and especially don't like the fact that they are considered outcasts However, sometimes a weird boy can get attached to the feelings they get when using their powers and start to enjoy them. They stop being ashamed of their powers and learn to control them better. These are called warp heads. One of the most famous weird boys is old Zogwart. His spore began to grow in a den of poisonous vipers and from the first minutes of his birth he was already covered in poisonous bites. However, he did not die and even more he began to bite back. By the time he came to the surface, his bites had also become venomous. The snakes coiled around him, but not biting him, but basking against the orc's scarred skin. In the tribe to which Zogwart had fallen, he was considered the favor of the god Mork. Over time, strange things began to happen around Zogwart. It became apparent that he possessed Weird Boy's powers. In one battle, he turned an entire squad of Imperial Guards into squigs and in another, he released so much energy that his eyes burst. However, Zogwart claims that this was done on purpose, and that Mork himself is now leading him. At the moment, the famous fighter travels the galaxy, joining various war bosses, becoming a favorite of the Orcs, especially after an enemy commander suddenly turns into a squig. Orc life is full of aggression and battles. If there is an enemy, they go on the attack. If there is no enemy, they shoot at each other until a new enemy appears. At any moment, a stronger orc can take away another orc's weapon and punch him in the face. Sometimes, young orcs tire of this life and enlist in Storm Boys units, mobile melee assault squads that use rocket packs for surprise attacks. The Storm Boys have a discipline unprecedented for orcs. Ordinary orcs do not understand such order and often laugh when they see the Storm Boys marching lines. However, every war boss understands the high value of such units in battle. The most important and dangerous equipment of the Storm Boys are rocket packs filled with explosive fuel. This equipment is extremely unstable. At best, the orc loses control and flies in an unpredictable direction. At worst, the satchel explodes, sometimes not even in the enemy camp. Boys like to watch the funny fireworks during the battle, when the Storm Boys collide and explode in the sky, causing chain explosions. The greatest of the Storm Boys is Zagstruk, commander of the famous Vulture Squad. 
This orc is known for his toughness and is feared and respected even by some war bosses. A space marine dreadnought once ripped his legs off, but Zagstruck was so tough that he chewed through the machine's important wires with his teeth, disabling it. After the fight, he ordered bionic implants with power claws instead of feet, which he named Da Vulture's Claws, becoming even more deadly. Next in line are the Commando, true masters of sabotage among the Orcs, which is unusual for such a loud and outspoken race. They specialize in stealth and sabotage, using their skills to launch surprise attacks and create havoc in enemy ranks. They like to apply camouflage to their skin, for which they have received the disapproval of ordinary boys who don't understand how you can paint others green, because if you're not green, you're not an Orc. However, as in the case of Storm Boys, the Orcs have to put up with such strange guys as their work behind enemy lines is terrifying. A living legend among the Commandos is a boss named Sneakrot. One day, his tribe was nearly wiped out by Imperial Guard forces. Sneakrot gathered the survivors and trained them in the skills of disguise and stealthy assassination. They removed all their uniforms and learned to blend in with their surroundings. After honing their skills, Snickrot and his team began infiltrating Imperial Guard barracks at night, taking out sleeping soldiers. The Commandos earned the nickname Red Skulls for their habit of scalping enemies. Among the enemies of the Orcs, legends abound of a lone ghost assassin who can stealthily infiltrate anywhere and who carries the tokens of the slain on his hands. In the silence of the night, he whispers their names, and no one can escape his skillfully sharpened knives. Here, the most disciplined part of the Orc army ended. Then we move on to the really crazy guys. First up are the Tank Busters, specialists who deliberately hunt for enemy vehicles. The Tank Busters have a special initiation ritual. A newcomer, having hit his first tank, must eat the crew of the vehicle and drink engine oil from his captured trophy. The tank boosters love to decorate themselves with various parts from the tanks they have hit. Their armament mainly consists of rockets, bombs and mines. However, among them there are some madmen who hit tanks in close combat with a rocket hammer, which is a small rocket filled with explosives attached to a stick. This weapon is effective against both the vehicle and the carrier because most often the impact of such a hammer is lethal for both sides. Next are the burner boys. These are orcs armed with flamethrowers and are real fans of flame. They get incredible pleasure from the screams of an enemy engulfed in flames and the smell of roasting meat. They carry heavy barrels of flammable liquid behind their backs and their flamethrowers have two firing modes, as regular flamethrowers and as plasma cutters. Arsonists are much appreciated by orc mechanics as they can help them slice through sheets of steel with their flamethrowers. Every orc likes to lug something shooting or exploding off the battlefield. However, there are some special looting enthusiasts among them. These are the looters. They are real professionals in stealing and are ready to steal anything that lies badly, both from the enemy and from their tribesmen. Some of them even manage to steal enemy combat vehicles. Orcs don't particularly like the looters for their propensity to steal. But the looters themselves recognize that if something is stolen from them, it was stolen honestly. Looters like to wear blue clothing items to find more valuable loot on the battlefield. They are the main suppliers of various gimmicks to the mech boys, who in turn supply them with custom def guns, huge and fast firing cannons that do a tremendous amount of damage and make a lot of noise. Speed, kill and volume are the main parameters of the orc small arms known as Daka. The word Daka refers to both the process of firing the weapon and the characteristic sound that the weapon makes. There are some particularly wealthy individuals among the orcs known as Flash Gits, the elite Orc Gunners. They are arrogant and consider themselves the best among the Orcs. Because of their arrogance, they often become outcasts, kicked out by bosses for excessive poncing. These Orcs form gangs and engage in piracy, becoming Corsairs. They like to wear extravagant clothes with bright colours, many accessories in the form of medallions and trophies. A characteristic feature of their appearance as usual is the odd-looking hat. 
In combat, the Flash Gits use SNAS guns, deadly and unique weapons created by the Mech Boys. Each weapon is unique, but they're all incredibly powerful. The most famous of the Flash Gits is Captain Captain Badrook, who has fought at the side of many great Orc war bosses. He is incredibly rich and powerful. His captain's hat is adorned with medals of defeated spaceship captains. His teeth are covered with gold and adamantium alloy, and his commander's overcoat protects him from the radiation emitted by his Dar Ripper weapon. The Dar Ripper is a modified weapon that originally belonged to the Ogryn bodyguard of a planetary governor. Badrook modified it, and now it constantly emits a strong radioactive background and fires volleys that resemble explosions of small suns. Badrook was banished from his clan for excessive wealth, and he now offers the services of his crew to any war boss with enough treasure to pay. A feature of the Orc economy is their currency, teeth. These are literally Orc teeth that grow throughout their lives, often falling out and being replaced by new ones. Orcs use these teeth as a means of payment, so an Orc can either wait for enough teeth to fall out to buy a new weapon, or he can buy them from his tribesmen. The teeth deteriorate over time, which prevents inflation in their economy. Next, let's talk about Orc clans. There are many tribes and gangs throughout the galaxy that can eventually join one of the six major clans. Perhaps even the predisposition to a certain clan is laid down on a genetic level. The largest of these is the Goths clan. They are renowned for their belligerence and often fight against each other within the clan. The traditional color of the clan is black, symbolizing hardness and toughness. Therefore, it is believed that boys from Goths are the toughest in battle. The clan's emblem is a bull's head, and many clan fighters wear horns on their helmets. The Goths consider themselves the most important and try to always start ruling over other orcs. Most war boss and knobs come from this clan, including the great prophet of Gork and Mork, Gazukul Mug Uruk Thraka. The next clan is Evil Sons. This is the clan where speed freaks and speed cultists flock to. They experience the incredible emotions of fast driving and constantly strive to experience them again, spending a lot of teeth on improving their machines. The Evil Sons clan also has the largest number of mechanics compared to other clans, as maintaining Speed Freak's machinery is a sure way to get rich. The main colour of this clan is red, because Orcs believe that the colour red makes everything go faster. The emblem of the clan is an image of a red sun with a grinning face. The clan is known for its talented drivers and bikers. The richest clan is the Bad Moons clan because its members have teeth that grow faster than other orcs. Bad Moons trade with other clans, buying the best weapons, armor and equipment. They also have the largest number of Gretchen, slaves. The clan's color is yellow, and the emblem consists of a yellow crescent moon and black tongues of flame. Death Skulls Clan this clan has a bad reputation among other clans because of their tendency to steal, loot and pillage. They collect various items, even trash, in hopes that it may come in handy in the future. Death Skulls. Mechs have a constant supply of components to create cool weapons, and the looters try to cooperate with this clan by trading loot. Death Skulls have a huge amount of stolen equipment, which they convert into their monstrous machines. Because of this, Death Skulls don't like tank busters, as their specialization in explosions doesn't allow them to get great tanks. The symbol of the clan is a horned skull, and the main color is blue. Orcs of this clan like to paint in blue not only their clothes, weapons and equipment, but also all their skin, and decorate themselves with amulets made of skulls and bones. Blood Axe Clan. They were the first to meet the Imperium of Man and learned much from it. This clan is characterized by cunning and guile. Stormboys and Commando are very much a part of the clan. Blood Axe Orcs often trade with Imperium and even act as mercenaries on their side. This is distrusted by other clans, but the Blood Axes find pleasure in shooting the enemy in the back with weapons they just bought from them. The clan's symbol is two red crossed axes with a skull in the middle, due to the tradition of not wiping the weapons clean of enemy blood after battle. Orcs can sometimes be born on planets without advanced civilization. They grow up in primitive hunter tribes without technological. However, an orc with a loincloth and a club is still an incredibly dangerous opponent. 
For the most part, these are tribes of primitive hunters and chasers of squigs. Occasionally, such tribes are stumbled upon by gangs or clans and take them in. But if such a tribe is lucky enough to run into a snake bites clan, for the most part, nothing will change. This clan favors tradition over technology without the use of force fields or machines. They are famous for their skill in raising squigs and squiggoths. Sometimes they purposefully remain at the level of development of wild orcs, despite all conditions for further technological progress. The symbol of the clan is the snake, which is associated with the initiation ritual in which a young orc is subjected to multiple bites from poisonous snakes. Freebooters, orc pirates, can also be categorized as an orc clan, a collection of scum from different clans. These orcs reject all ties to their past clans, begin to decorate themselves with nose and ear piercings, as well as emblems of Jolly Orc, the symbol of all orc pirates. Freebooters often do not have access to docks and mechs, so their equipment can be repaired by the most artisanal methods. Well, pirates flaunt eye patches, wooden legs and crooked hooks for hands. They are commanded by Cap, the coolest, strongest and richest orc sea. The brightest colours have become their clothes. Freebooters plunder ships, engage in piracy, trade with other clans and are hired as powerful weapon support, having the biggest guns and the best fleet. We've talked a bit about the animals integrated into orcish communities. However, these creatures are so important that Command has asked for more information to let you know. They can be incredibly different from one another. The most commonly encountered species are attack squigs. They are most likely small, meaty, toothy balls on legs, extremely agile and aggressive. War bosses like to have them as pets, and slavers use them as motivators to fight for their wards. Tankbusters train these squigs to carry explosives and rush at enemy tanks, using them as live projectiles. There are also much more interesting varieties, for example, edible squigs. Of course, a hungry orc can eat anyone, but these squigs are the juiciest and tastiest. They are quite rare and can be afforded mostly by bosses or knobs. Or, for example, some of the most important squigs are the hairy ones. These small oblong creatures covered in long hair with small teeth around the head. They cling intentionally to the wearer and slowly feed on their blood. It is with their help that orcs make their hairstyles and beards. After all, it just so happens that by nature all orcs are bald. Their natural regeneration allows them not to feel the discomfort of slowly pumping out blood. Plus, for example, the pain boys use them as a medical stapler on wounds. The second important Maddox tool are squig needles, small creatures with a very long and sharp proboscis. They can be pumped with any liquid and used as a syringe, for mechs, on the other hand, the most favourite are the squigs oilers. They constantly produce a substance inside them that looks like technical oil. Gretchens capture these and use them to lubricate the mechanisms of their master's inventions. Squiggy designators are used primarily by flash gits as a biological analogue to guidance systems. The single eye of such creatures is incredibly sighted and their natural resilience allows them to not die once attached to guidance systems. In general, there are an incredible number of species of squigs. Here is a short list of the most interesting ones. Squig Face Eater is used in the National Orc Sports Game, where an orc must eat a squig faster than it bites its face off. Paint Squigs. These are actually used to extract paint for orcish use. Squidgens are used for scouting and delivering messages. Weird squigs are a very rare type. With brains brimming with psychic energy, they are used as psi bombs. Then, of course, they include the giant squiggoths. Also note that there are varieties even bigger than squiggoths. They are called Orchiosaurus. They're incredibly rare. Now, let's get down to the orc technique. First, let's note that orcs have mastered the technologies of bionics, force weapons, force fields, teleportation and almost endless variations of lethal melee and ranged weapons. And as you already know, Mechi Boy's creations can vary greatly from each other. So here we will give average data on each type of technique. However, on the battlefield, get ready for any techno heresy you can imagine. Let's start with Orc bikes. On average, they are not much different from human motorcycles. However, each orc biker tries to give his or her vehicle some individuality, whether it's with jewellery, trophies or lethality, and number of guns. 
Orcs consider the most important qualities in bikes to be their speed, the loudness of their engines, and the shooting, the volume and number of guns, and the size of the dust clouds that their bikes leave behind. The most notable bike is the transportation of the great boss Wazdaka Gutsmek, which he named Bike of the Apocalypse. Continuing the theme of light vehicles, we must mention the war buggy and war truck. Their variations are endless. In general, it is a small vehicle on wheels or tracks with a cannon mounted on it. The team of such vehicles consists of a driver and one or even several shooters. The main vehicle is the fast but fragile truck. They are the ones that mainly transport the boys to the battlefield. They are equipped with heavy shooters or rockets, ball rams and siege ramps. A more armoured and powerful version of the transport is battle wagons. Bosses and knobs move around on these. They can be equipped with additional armour, a huge arsenal of heavy weapons, and the iconic weapon of this technique Def Rollers, a spiked roller installed in the front of the wagon and crushing enemy infantry. There is also an even heavier version of the wagons, Battle Fortress. In terms of armour thickness and lethality of weapons, such tanks can compete even with some titans. The size and power depend only on the wealth of the boss and the talent of the mechs. Orcs also like to steal enemy vehicles. They call them looted wagons. Their combat power directly depends on the original design and the flight of fancy of the mech that decided to improve it. In addition to wheeled vehicles, the Orcs also have their own combat walkers. The smallest of these are the Killer Cans. Killer Cans are primitive walkers the size of a Space Marine Dreadnought armed to the teeth with cannons. Due to the nature of their design, their creation requires Mech Boys and Pain Boys to work together. Mech Boys are designing the hull. Pain Boys are searching for pilots for this war machine. Killer Cans are not Orcs, but Grots. And this happens forever, because they are welded to the construction of the walker. Having received enormous power, the terrified Grotas become incredibly aggressive. Sometimes they may even plot revenge on their earlier offenders. And despite the fact that one such killer Khan can slaughter entire squads of enemies, their pilots are still cowardly creatures and can lose control of them during combat. Next in line is a more pumped up version, the Deaf Dreads. They are twice the size of killer cans, with double the number of arms for warfare, and their pilots are already orcs, but they are also welded to the structure. Overall, there's not much difference from the killer cans, except for the increased power, size and bravery of the pilots. Sometimes even orcs ask to be pilots themselves. After all, this is the fulfillment of their dream, to become one of the strongest warriors of their gang, with giant guns in their hands. Too late they realize that the price of that is eternity in a metal prison. But even this is not the final version of the Orcish Walkers. Gorkonauts and Morkonauts became the next stage in the evolution of Orc genius. The final stage in the evolution of the Walkers. The Gorkonauts show the power of the Gork. They have incredibly thick armor, unimaginable in size and power cannons. Such fortress shagger ships are piloted by knobs. Morkonauts, on the other hand, illustrate the guile and cunning of the Mork. They carry a force shield generator that gives protection not only to the Morkonaut itself, but also to the area around it, giving protection to allied infantry. They are usually armed with a variety of energy weapons like the Custom Mega Cannon. Manned, such vehicles are already mech boys. Both of these varieties can already carry small squads of Orcs inside them. Next come Walkers, with sizes up to Imperial Titans. Orcs gathering in huge armies begin to build huge robots that are both self-propelled and heavily armoured gun platforms, and idols of their gods Gork and Mork. The Orcs believe that the machines they build are the gods themselves, to whom they have given a physical body and help control them. The deities themselves lead their people to war. The smallest variety of such giants is the Stomper. It's the same as Gorkonauts and Morkonauts, but bigger, fatter, louder, deadlier and more dangerous. There are as many as three crews of Gretchen Helpers, and a few mech boys already labouring inside such hulks. Although most often Stomper look like a revitalised pile of scrap metal, they should not be underestimated. One of these is already a problem, and during major wars you can find entire squads of several stomps.
They carry entire arsenals of powerful weapons and mech boys do their best to keep the walker from falling apart or exploding during battle. Then there are the Gargants, even more gigantic and dangerous orcish titans. They are all unique as they are only built at rare moments when orcs unite into truly huge armies. Even steam-powered Gargants in not the most technologically advanced Wa'args have been encountered. The latest varieties of orc titans are the Mega Gargants, the pinnacle of mech boys' genius, colossal machines that the orcs reverently revere as the actual bodies of their gods. Only the most brilliant big mechs were capable of designing such machines. They are incredible-sized walking fortresses armed with an absurd amount of weaponry. Inside they can carry entire armies of regular boys, serving such a behemoth are dozens of Gretchen brigades and many mech boys. The Mega Gargant was last seen in the war for the Vigilus system after the fall of Cadia and the galaxy was split in half by a huge warp rift. Now let's move on to Orc aviation. The lightest Orc flying machines are the Defcopters and Warcopters. The former are single-seat small helicopters with heavy shooters or missiles. They are used for reconnaissance and swift strikes using the hit-retreat tactic. Warcopters are light air transports capable of carrying an entire squad of boys. They are also Commando's favourite transport. Then there are the Orc planes. And first, let's talk about the pilots. We have already told about the Cult of Speed, especially popular in the clan Evil Suns. However, there are those who have gone even further. Orcs who no longer have enough speed on the ground and want to soar into the sky and accelerate even more. Such are called flyboys, and the rest of the Orcs consider them even more repulsive than the speed cultists. The most common mode of transportation for such boys are Dacca jets. They are a single-seat fighter with four super shooters mounted on them that can cover the enemy with a barrage of bullets. The legendary Orc pilot de Crimson Baroon flew one of these planes, and during his last battle against the Necrons and the White Scar Space Marines at the same time, he managed to cause carnage in the skies. When he was hit by a Doom Scythe, he survived the fall, taking the plane from a nearby flyboy that had not yet taken off. He then shot down four more Doom Scythe before being hit again by a White Scar rocket launcher. It is not known if Baroon survived in the end, but legends about him continue to be passed around among pilots. Next are the Blitzer Bombers, which are not very different from the Dacca Jets, but instead of mounted shooters, they carry huge bombs, dropping them on enemy heads. The most tricked out of the Orc planes is the Wasbomb Blaster Jet. This plane is flown exclusively by a mech boy pilot. It is equipped with various energy cannons like teleporter mega blaster or custom mega cannons, as well as force field sources. Well, and finally, next comes already space fleet of orcs. To summarize in terms of categorizing ships by composition, the Orochi fleet differs little from the Imperial fleet or from the known fleets of other races. The main difference is the method of ship construction. The Orcs rarely have a full-fledged space shipyard, and so they do the simpler thing. They find ready-made ones. There are hundreds of abandoned ships drifting around the galaxy, or even entire space hulks stapled together wrecks of ships and asteroids. Orcs capture them, and if necessary, improve them. Separately, it is worth highlighting such a class of ships as Attack Moon. These are captured asteroids or planetoids, on the surface of which the most powerful engines and cabins are built which turns a once huge piece of rock into another Orc flying machine. That's where we're done with Orc technology. Once again, let us remind you that we have not told about many species discovered by the Empire's mind because of their gigantic number and the fact that they may be too rare to be found on the battlefield. We would like to conclude our series with a brief story about one of the most dangerous Orcs. He is still alive and is one of the main targets of Officio Assassinorum. One of the most dangerous creatures in the entire galaxy is Gajkul Mag Uruk Thraka. He is the prophet of Gork and Mork and the war boss of one of the greatest Wag. We brought him up in the Grotznik story and there was his brief backstory, which is quite sufficient. The birth of the prophet Gork and Mork occurred precisely after the operation of Grotznik. Gajkul began to hear strange voices in his head. At first, he thought it was because of his new plate that replaced the top of his skull. 
But then he realized that the gods themselves had chosen him and were speaking to him. Visions of the past, present and future began to visit him. His intellect grew immensely and a clear goal formed in his mind. To unite all orcs under his rule and lead them into the greatest battles in the history of the galaxy. The first to stand in his way was Warboss, who was the boss warband of Grotznik. Only stepping out of the mad dock's tent, Gushkul made his way towards the boss. He only laughed when he heard the challenge from the regular boys. Deciding to finish off the upstart, the boss unloaded the full load of his guns on Gajkul. However, not a single bullet or explosion hit the young orc. He quickly closed the distance with the war boss and began beating his opponent savagely. Gajkul delivered the final blow with his headplate, after which he stood up and announced that this was only the beginning, and that he was the voice of Gork and Mork. And whoever doesn't like it, let them come up and try to argue it. Gushkul spent the next hour fighting with dissenters, getting only a couple of small scratches in all these battles. Even then, many took this as divine intervention, as Gushkul had grown significantly in size in such a short time. He quickly seized power in this and all neighboring tribes and bands of orcs, continuing his conquest of the planet. However, he soon had to face a more powerful tribe. This is where the tactical genius of the young boss came into play. With the help of cunning plans, his army managed to subdue the warring tribe and then seize the entire planet Urk in general. Gajkul became the first boss in many thousands of years who was able to subdue tribes with such ease. Within six years, the entire planet had become his. A huge army of orcs marched under his command and the war boss himself grew to an impressive size. Soon after the unification of the planet, the sun of their system began to dim and the prophet of the gods announced that this was a sign from Gork and Mork that it was time to start conquering other planets as well. A huge space hulk came out of the warp rift nearby, drifting straight toward the planet Urk. Gajkul ordered it to be orbited and refitted, and began building primitive transport ships. During the troop transfer, it turned out to be inhabited by warp demons, and while billions of orcs were gradually transported to space hulk, the boys who had already landed were mopping up the decks. In the end, victory was on Gajkul's side. He named their new ship World Killer and ordered it to be sent into a warp storm. The Orc War for the Galaxy had begun.